Mohon keperhatian kepada Bapak dan Ibu. Beberapa saat lagi share kita kita mulai. Untuk itu mohon izin supaya bisa mengisi barisan satu dan dua dulu supaya kalau ada yang menyusul bisa di belakang. Gitu. Silakan Pak. Mundurin dulu, mundurin dulu kan. Jeng satu. Baik, mohon perhatian acara akan segera kita mulai. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi dan salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Salam sehat juga untuk kita semua. Yang sama-sama kita hormati uh, narasumber pada International Lecture Series pada hari ini, Profesor Adam Zolinman. Welcome to Brin, Prof. Yang juga terhormati moderator kita, Bapak Rudi Haris Alam. Pak Rudi, selamat pagi Bapak. Dan juga Kepala Pusat Riset Masyarakat dan Budaya, Badan Riset dan Inovasi Nasional. Puji syukur kita menjadikan kehadiran Allah Subhanahu ta'ala Tuhan Yang Maha Esa. Atas karunia pada pagi hari ini kita dapat hadir di tempat ini untuk mengikuti acara International Lecture Series. Dan untuk acara yang pertama, kita akan menyanyikan lagu Kebangsaan Indonesia Raya. Seluruh hadirin dimohon untuk berdiri. National Anthem Indonesia Raya, please rise up. Indonesia tanah airku, tanah tumpah darahku. Di sanalah aku berdiri, jadi pandu ibuku. Indonesia kebangsaanku, bangsa dan tanah airku. Marilah kita berseru, Indonesia bersatu. Hiduplah tanahku, hiduplah negeriku, bangsaku, rakyatku, semuanya. Bangunlah jiwanya, bangunlah badannya untuk Indonesia Raya. Indonesia Raya, merdeka, merdeka, tanahku, negeriku yang ku cinta. Indonesia Raya, 
Merdeka, merdeka, hiduplah Indonesia Raya. Indonesia Raya, merdeka, merdeka, tanahku, negeriku yang ku cinta. Indonesia Raya, merdeka, merdeka, hiduplah Indonesia Raya. Hadirin dipersilakan duduk kembali. Baik hadirin yang berbahagia untuk kesempatan uh, International Lecture Series pada pagi hari ini akan diawali dengan opening remark atau sambutan pembuka yang akan disampaikan oleh Kepala Pusat Riset Masyarakat dan Budaya kepada Ibu Lilis, kami silakan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, shalom, om swastiastu, namo buddhaya rahayu. Honorable Professor Adam Seligman, Dr. Riwanto Tirto Sudarmo, Dr. Rudi Harisah Alam, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to stand here today to welcome you all in this distinguished international lecture with Professor Adam Seligman on the challenge of difference on categories on, and belonging. Following our communication uh, with Dr. Riwanto Tirto Sudarmo, we were very excited to learn about Professor Seligman's visit to Indonesia. And for that rare opportunity, we are pleased and honored that Professor Seligman have positively agreed to our invitation and be here today with us. As a newly integrated research, center, research uh, agency, BRIN is facing challenges on di of different research culture of our researchers, previously working on different state ministries and uh, institutes. Subject matter wise, there is a need to broaden the horizon and uh, to an enter global discussion on many social and humanities themes, including on differences. So that is why we try to, uh, to create or to build up uh, a lecture series in, at, at our research center to and invite uh, scholars from global uh, institutes, global university, so that we can share uh, different opinions, different ideas and different uh, concepts about a lot of things. And it's such an opportunity for us to learn about uh, differences from uh, Professor Seligman, who is the expert on religion studies at Boston University. Thank you, Professor, for coming and sharing your thought with us today. So for my colleagues in uh, Research Center for Society and Culture, Research Organization for Social Humanities and uh, Social, uh, Social Science and Humanities, let us uh, learn a lot from uh, Professor Seligman's uh, sharing experience, his experience working with different groups, working uh, with different uh, institutions, different educational, uh, religious education uh, institutes or uh, uh, yeah, institutes uh, all over the world and learn how to manage differences because Indonesia is known as a, a multicultural, multi-diverse, multi-religion uh, nation. And we are living with differences uh, each and every day in our lives. And of course, it is a challenge, but it is also an opportunity for us to learn about these differences. But the history already uh, taught us that uh, the challenges of living in differences is bigger than the opportunities that we can uh, embrace. Although Indonesia have uh, Bineka Tunggal Ika, or living in harmony with different uh, different. Uh, even though we are varied, but we are united, that Bineka Tunggal Ika is like the principle of our nation, we still uh, facing that challenges uh, deriving from differences. Uh, we still see a lot of conflicts coming from uh, like religious conflict, uh, communal conflict based on like race or based on ethnic groups, diversity. And it, uh, Although we also uh, see a lot of uh, good practices 
uh, in in the community where people living uh, side by side in harmony, but those good uh, those good practices are very uh, less heard than the conflict that we see from day to day in the news. So I think we are really uh, fortunate to have uh, Professor Seligman to have uh, share his experience here with us today, uh, this morning until this afternoon. And I hope that uh, this opportunity can be uh, strengthen us in terms of uh, like uh, concept or on differences and also uh, give us more insights and perspectives coming from uh, international scholars. And I hope that everyone can also uh, grasp the new, uh, this new insight for their researches uh, back home here in, in Indonesia or maybe to share about the Indonesian situation with uh, glo another global scholars. Thank you. And I hope uh, for a fruitful discussion and lecture. And uh, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please give applause to Bu Lilis. Thank you for your remarks, Ibu. Ladies and gentlemen, for international lecture today, we'll bring by moderator Mr. Rudy Harisa Alam. To Mr. Rudy, the time is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. MC. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good day to you all. I'm Rudy Harisha Alam, a researcher and also a program coordinator at the Research Center on uh, Religion and Belief under uh, the Institute for Social Science and Humanities, um, BRIM. I'm pleased to be a moderator for today's lecture. Uh, that will be uh, given by uh, Professor Adam uh, Seligman uh, on the topics, the challenge of difference on categories and group belonging. So uh, Professor Adam will be giving a lecture about uh, 40 minutes, right? But before that, I will uh, inform you some uh, biography for, uh, uh, of uh, Professor uh, Seligman. Uh, as already mentioned, uh, Professor Seligman is a professor of uh, religion at uh, Boston University, also a research associate at the University's Institute on Culture, Religion, and World Affairs. And he also uh, uh, the director of CHEDAR. Yeah. Maybe uh, you know CHEDAR is kind of three, a prof. Channel three is associated commonly with uh, something uh, spiritual uh, protection and uh, and else. Uh, actually, uh, Chedar is uh, stand for communities engaging with uh, difference and uh, religion. Professor Seligman also received the prestigious uh, Dr. Leopold Lucas Prize in 2020 for his extensive work on peace, I think. So uh, among uh, Professor Selkman's works, uh, the book's title, The Idea of a Civil Society, published in uh, 1992, uh, is also in the worldly individualism, the problem of trust, and uh, more, the most recent, I think, uh, living with difference, how to build community in a divided world that is, I think, is, uh, relevant with our topic today. Uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Professor Stegman, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you.
Khan. Thank you for coming in the morning to listen to me. And thank you for inviting me. Thank Bryn for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you. I think I gave my first academic lecture when I was a graduate student. So that would have been in the early 1980s. That would have been 40 years ago. So I've been giving lectures for about 40 years. And this is the first time it started with a national anthem. And um, that's really cool and is exactly kind of the theme of what I want to talk about, which is particular differences, different ways of living, different ways of doing things, the different frames. The different frames through which we make sense of the world. Um, so I'm going to talk for about 40, 40 minutes. And um, then I hope we can have a, a, a conversation. I, I should say that um, what I'm going to talk about is not so much the result of research in libraries um, and all the different type of work that went into the different books that I wrote and so on, um, no, nor is it the result of um, properly sort of academic scholarly research. Um, it it's, comes out of my attempt to make sense of this program of CEDAR that you were kind enough to mention, communities engaging with difference in religion. Um, we're now entering our third decade, third decade of um, running programs all over the world. And we actually have affiliate programs in Japan, Indonesia, East Africa, Bulgaria, different places. Um, so it's an attempt, part of a broader attempt of mine to kind of understand what we've been doing and uh, what needs to be done, actually, what needs to be done. So the, um, the theme, uh, the title of my lecture is, um, is uh, as we did say, the challenge of difference on categories and group belonging. I'd start by saying that whatever other events may emerge to characterize the 21st century, one phenomena is by now pretty well established. And that is that the challenge of living with difference is coming to define cultural and political realities throughout the world. By living with difference, I mean something very, very simple. I mean living with, accommodating, sharing a public life in city streets, schools, hospitals, yoga studios, sports clubs, youth groups, so on. Sharing a life with people whose religious beliefs, political commitments, ways of life, food, sexual preferences, dress, habits, family arrangements, skin color, mother tugs, physiognomies and cultural loyalties may be very different from our own. Now, on the one hand, you can say that such realities are historically not particularly new. The great empires of the past whether the Roman Empire, the Ottoman, the Austro-Hungarian and others, were all diverse, almost by definition. Empires have to be diverse or else there wouldn't be empires. They were polygot, multi-religious, multi-ethnic and encompassed within their boundaries, multiple ways of life. On the other hand, we must recall that the emergence of the modern nation state apropos the national anthem, the emergence of the modern nation state was accompanied to a greater or lesser attempt, extent by attempts to homogenize the population so that all citizens would share one language, one cuisine, think of the rice policy in Indonesia, one idea of home and belonging, one moral definition and one vision of community. All this is, of course, no less true for those very nations that emerged from the destruction of the Ottoman 
and Austro-Hungarian empires in the First World War. Moreover, and critically, this ideal of national homogeneity was often defined in terms of some purported ethnic or racial purity, a conceit that may indeed go back to the Reconquista and the subsequent expulsion of Jews and Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula at the end of the 15th century. Whatever its lineage, the idea of a racially pure polity continues to fascinate and attract even in our own century, even following the horrors perpetrated in its name in the previous one. Am I speaking slowly enough? Okay. Today, however, and whatever nostalgic sentiments many seem to hold towards an imagined past of racial, ethnic, or cultural purity, the existing social reality rests, resists such conformity to an ever increasing degree. There are many and varied reasons for this. Worldwide demographic changes, as well as eco ecological crisis that have led to the rise of ever increasing numbers of refugees and migrants, not only in Europe, but in Africa and Southeast Asia as well. The rise of so-called identity politics and demands by different and numerous minorities for recognition, as well as representation in the public sphere. The political fracturing of the post-World War II nation state and the rise of populist politics, the loss of a shared public sphere are just some among the well-known causes of the increased need to learn how to live with difference in a world greatly changed from that that some of us grew up with, those of us over a certain age. As some of these developments and the consequent changes in the social configuration of nation states has resulted in the need to confront difference in a manner few have been accustomed to. And this as we are coming to see is evolving as no small challenge. While these challenges have most often been discussed in terms of polity orientations or a political philosophy of liberalism, what I will suggest in the following is that facing the continuing challenges of difference demands of us a psychological and cognitive adjustment of a somewhat surprising and unexpected nature. I would in fact argue that to approach this social reality of radical difference in a civil as well as an ethical manner will demand of us nothing less than a willingness to be uncomfortable and to reject the easy comforts that certain approaches to difference and otherness tend to promulgate. Facing difference with wise, eyes wide open is a serious challenge that will require us to tolerate or bear a degree and type of discomfort that we are in fact unused to. Yet I would claim that however untimely or inconvenient, it is necessary. I'd like now to turn to why. Why is difference uncomfortable? Why is living with difference uncomfortable? Because we all know that what is different can also be the source of attraction, of excitement, and interest. We go to foreign countries. We eat food that's new to us when we come from Boston to Indonesia, for instance. Right? Um, I just heard some of it was a favorite of President Obama. Okay? So, we like difference, we're attracted to difference. But I want to claim that this is only the case when in some sense, we can control our exposure to what is different and control its consequences. We will often flirt with difference, but only when there is a safe route of retreat. We will try to calibrate as close as possible our exposure to have just enough for the encounter to be interesting and exciting, but not enough to be truly dangerous. I'll go to Mexico to experience a new culture, but I won't go into a favela at night because it might be dangerous, right? So I'm interested, but I wanna control how much of that difference I'm exposed to. We do this when we go to hiking trips, when we engage in alpine skiing, touring foreign countries, and even when flirting with an attractive 
interlocutor at a bar, right? The flirting is exposing ourselves, but from this we can see that this calibration may extend not only to physical aspects of the encounter, we choose to take one trail on a hike and not another. We choose to sleep in the jungle or only go for day trips and come back at night to our five-star hotel. Yeah, see what I mean? Um, so not only the physical aspects, but also the psychological and cognitive ones as well. I remember I, I, I had a friend, a colleague, um, Emil in Kyrgyzstan, who, uh, who had uh, returned to his to the sources of Islamic faith. And we were, uh, he was a tabliki, he was a member of Tablik al-Jamat. And we were talking about theology and the problem of theodicy and so on. And I asked him if he had ever read the book of Job in the Bible. And Job is a story that's across cultures, it actually originated in non-monotheistic religions, the story of Job, versions of it in Babylonian. And he refused, he said, I'm taught not to look at other scriptures. Other scriptures were dangerous for him. Well, okay, I think you could expose yourself to another scripture. It doesn't mean you will convert to another religion. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so, psychological and cognitive control my friend wanted to exert, was determined to exert cognitive control. And it is with these that I want to be concerned in this lecture. Um, for more often than not, the control we must muster, control we enact over what is di different, certainly in, in our interaction with individuals and groups who are different, is of an internal and cognitive nature and not always an external and physical one. I'm not talking about a situation of danger. So what I'm trying to say here to set up the problem is that often we can, and that's what I'm going to talk about, often we cannot physically control the other. I can't physically control you. You can't control me. But we kind of maintain some cognitive control in our own heads. And that's very important because it's in our heads. I live in my head, not in your head. And you live in your head, not in my head. So that's, that's the problem. And this is what I want to talk about. An internal cognitive control is needless to say, not any form of real control over the other person's and her actions, thoughts, intentions, emotions, plans. It is control of neither her internal states or her external act. It is, however, a control over the nature and effect of how her eternal states and external acts impinge on me and my life and my desires, my understandings, my thoughts, my intentions, my frames of knowledge. For our most common and indeed most reasonable response when faced with something new and untold, that is something different, is to position it within our existing already established categories and frames of meaning. Is that clear? We see something different, we don't know what it is, we reframe it into what we already know. When the difference is one of race or religion or sexual orientation or indeed gender identity, such categorization of the other person is generally understood as prejudice and so is morally suspect and something to be avoided. As we go about our lives, however, we cannot do without such prior categorizations, not only of people, but of places, tools, all manner of what philosophers call natural kinds, hills, rivers, shoals, trees, boulders, as well as social categories, cousins, clans, siblings, football teams, and so on. We know and hence respond to the world through our categories, which provide the frame by which different bits of information are given meaning primarily through their connection to other bits 
to form an idea or a view of the whole. So I come to give a lecture at Green Institute in Jakarta, and there is an introduction, there's a Madre Edil, but before that, there is the national anthem, which I have never heard in a lecture in 40 years of speaking all over the world. How do I make sense of it? How do I make sense of it? And I guarantee that the way I make sense of it is different from the way you make sense of it. But I can only frame it in my frame of pledging the allegiance when I was in school or whatever it is. I don't want to spend 20 minutes talking about that now, but that's an example of what I mean, right? It's totally different. It's totally unexpected. Not totally, because this told me we're going to say the national anthem. I said, oh, wow. Um, so again, I'm framing it in a very different frame than you. I don't have a frame of Manchasila. I don't have a frame of diversity and unity or unity and diversity or this. My frame is very different. This is a small thing that's not going to matter much, but other things matter. Um, I want to say because we frame it, because we frame discrete, discrete bits of information or events in terms of our already existing preconceptions, the act of changing, revising, reconfiguring, or indeed discarding our preconceptions, preconceptions that is our categories, what it means to say the national anthem, is a cause of discomfort. Am I clear so far? Yeah, still clear? Good. The armature, if I have to, dis if I have to disabuse myself of my existing conceptions, the armature of my world is shaken and I must search for a new coherence. It is always much preferred emotionally to maintain our existing assumptions, categories, and ways of seeing the world than to admit that they do not adequately encompass experience and so must be revised or jettisoned. Go out. We have recently witnessed, well, last year when it began, this very phenomena as Russian relatives even parents of Ukrainians refused to believe their own children's accounts of the bombing of Ukrainian cities and the horror caused by that bombing. This was written about very much in the first months of the war. Families living across the borders, the Ukrainians would speak on the phone to their families in Russia about the bombings in Kiev, in Lviv, in the, and the Russians didn't believe it. Because to believe it, the whole world would be shattered. That's too dangerous. That's too difficult to do. In many ways, it is much easier for us to deny our own experience or when it contradicts our taken for granted assumptions on the world to explain it away with some additional bit of information or assumption that leaves our fundamental categories intact. Thus, we will argue the individual exception to the rule rather than ch challenge the rules of veracity. Cognitively, it is much easier to claim that this particular Jew or Black or Muslim or lesbian does not conform to what we already know about Jews or Blacks or lesbians or Muslims um, for any contingent individual reasons than to question and be forced to revise what we know. So we say, ah, yes, well, you're a Muslim, but you're a good Muslim because you went to a Catholic school when you were growing up, for instance. Do you see what I'm trying to say? We'll make of the individual an exception so we can maintain our categories. Are you still following me or not? If not, spend more time trying to explain. It's clear or no? Don't just tell me. Yes? So when we're encountered by a phenomena that is an exception to what we think we already know, we maintain this process of control by making an exception of this particular experience. If the experience is dissonant to our existing normative framework, we want not to disturb the normative framework we avoid discomfort. 
or perhaps we trade the more threatening discomfort of a challenge to our whole conceptual universe for a much lesser one of dealing with an exception, making it, as we say in English, the exception that proves the rule. In this way too, we may evade any real confrontation with difference and the other. We do not accept the challenge to us that a real engagement with difference implies. The default predilection to maintain our existing categories, those that frame given bits of information is a strong one, precisely because the cost in not doing so, in discomfort, in cognitive confusion and dissonance is too great. In some forms of interaction, we may, as indicated, simply preserve the categories by naming, that is by categorizing, the particular case that challenges them as an exception. Important here to realize is that what is taken as a threat is not any particular bit of information, encounter or personal experience. It is rather only when these particular occurrences cannot be encompassed within our always already existing frames for organizing information and experience. It is not any particular bit of information per se that threatens my understanding of the world, of people, groups, and meanings. Rather, it is only when I am forced into a cognitive defense of my taken for granted world, that is of my existing categories, that some form of cognitive feint is invoked. The denial of difference, and that's what I'm getting to, of what my categories cannot encompass. I don't have a place to write. In other words, what I'm saying is difference is what I cannot encompass with what I already know. What I already know is my categories. Here? So difference is what is not encompassable by my existing categories. And the way I deal with it is often by trivializing difference, saying, oh, it's not important. It's not more important than our different tastes and shirts or hats. Well, trivialize, trivializing difference is a common trope in the United States and other liberal individualist societies. Um, and what it allows is the maintenance of cognitive control over the other aspects of difference in general, moves to trivialize difference are ways to avoid having to engage with it. By trivializing what is different, one makes a claim to its essential knowability and hence our ability to impose cognitive control. What makes us the same as Muslims, Episcopalians, Indonesians, Americans, or radical feminists is much more essential, so we say, much more essential to our understanding of who we are than any idiosyncratic aspect of personality or action that I cannot perhaps accommodate in my understanding of who you are. This too is a way of denying difference rather than engaging with it. In certain sense, such a denial of difference is itself a form of indifference to what is different. By framing the different nature of your position or action in taste of your tastes or trivial aspects of life, um, that do not fit into my cognitive ways, categories of explaining the world. I'm not forced to engage with it. I'm not forced to wrestle with it. I'm not forced to come to terms with you as you are. I can actually remain indifferent. I am spared the challenge that different ev difference evokes, as well as the discomfort that would thereby be, be summoned as I wrestle with a reality that did not fit into my existing perception of the world. Behind these dynamics is the fact that our categories are given to us by the groups we belong to. That is to say, our social, moral, as well as cognitive categories are collective products and not individual proclivities. The work of social psychologists from Jerome Bruner to Alexander Luria have demonstrated how even the nature of our perception of shape or color, for example, are products of social and historical forces and not inherent in the object itself. 
perception itself, perception itself cannot be divorced from acts of categorization. Do you understand the point here? We think that what we see is something objective out there but actually seeing it, we're already categorizing it. And this was Loria's important work in the 20s in, in Kyrgyzstan. Perception is not simply a physical or physiological act, but a cognitive one. And as such, it is affected by the forces that structure all categorization, that is social forces. Luria's seminal studies in Central Asia in the 30s among illiterate farmers showed how the absence of specific categories, that is discrete words for colors or shapes among uneducated people would group objects or shapes according to a situational logic. A drawing of three quarters of a circle would be identified as a bracelet rather than as something like a circle. Um, relations between objects, often in terms of their use value rather than any sort of abstract noun, did important work giving peasants, illiterate peasants, pictures of, um, I can't remember everything, but it was a, 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 a block of wood, an ax, um, a tree, some other natural object. And he asked, what was the exception? What didn't fit, right? A tree, a block of wood, an ax. Educated people said an ax because it's man-made, right? It's a tool, it's not natural. The uneducated people say they all fit together because an ax makes no sense without, without a tree. So they're all, they're all in the same category, different ways of categorizing, not abstract, but in terms of use value. See the point? Social, it's not in the object. If you see an ax and say that's different from a block of wood, that's because you already think in terms of categories. But if you're a peasant who's illiterate, you don't think in terms of those categories. You think acts and wood, they go together. They have to go together. Boom. Ah, there we go. I have it here. Saw, axe, log, hammer. It was the other way around, right? Saw, axe, log, hammer. So they refuse to single out any of the objects. While the educated people say the, the wood doesn't fit. Everything else is a tool. The saw, the axe, and the hammer. The peasants said, no, they all go together because then the tools don't make sense without the, without the wood. But um, for those without education, without educated categories that we all have, there was no way to separate the object. No use value to the object. Categories, as we see, are therefore abstractions through which we organize and explain experience, through which we perceive the world. These abstractions are moreover formed within groups and serve to explain both the group itself as well as other groups to group members. This is important, All right? When I, when we use categories to explain the other, we're using Social categories are social. We don't hold them individually through abstract reason. We hold them as members of a group. And so using them, we're not just explaining the world. We're saying, we're explaining the world. My group is explaining the world. We're communicating that in the explanation. I'll give you an example. In 2016, a young Jewish man in Strasbourg, France, was stabbed stabbed and killed um, by a young man shouting, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Bon. These are facts. Let's assume they're facts. These are reported empirical facts. Which is the important one? There's another point. So the ma a man was stabbed, the man was Jewish. The man who stabbed him was Muslim. The man who stabbed him was also somebody who had been in and out of mental institutions. Which is the relevant fact that explains the stabbing? The fact that he was Muslim or the fact that he was mentally ill? It depends if you ask a Jewish person or a Muslim person. <laughs> They'll say, yes, both are true, but this is the reason. No, no, both are true, but this is the reason. The facts themselves won't give you the reason. You see what I'm saying? It's how you frame them, how you use them, what's part of your explanation. And then, excuse me very much, but whether you're Jewish or Muslim is gonna make a big difference to what you see as critical. In, uh, 
in Birmingham, England in 20, uh, 2008, 2009. I don't know how long they were there. Um, the police put hidden cameras around the Muslim neighborhood of Birmingham. And the Muslim neighborhood of Birmingham, then anyway, looked, I was told, like Pakistan in the 1950s. Well, that's neither here nor there. The hidden cameras were discovered. The Muslim population said, this is a form of ghetto. You're tracking the license plates of everybody coming in and out. The English people said, not at all. This is just like in England. We want to make sure that people are, we want to make sure the traffic is flowing freely. Nobody in the public can get into the inner workings of the police department and know really why they put them there. But the explanation of the Anglo-English and the Pakistani Muslim, English citizen, British citizen, will be very, very different of why they were put there. Now, notice there's something else in the story that I gave you, which is true of any story. Our information is always incomplete. Our information of anything is always incomplete. There is no final explanation of anything. David Hume was claimed to have said, explanation is where the mind rests. So what, what means an explanation? When I stop asking why, when I have my answer, and I want to claim, that we often have our answer when our prejudices are confirmed, right? When our prejudices about Jews or lesbians or Muslims or English or Scotch or whatever are confirmed. That's when we say, ah, now we've explained it. There is no final explanation. What I'm trying to say is that our sense of group or belonging provides one of the most salient frames for making sense of information that is differences, information is difference in matters pertaining to other human beings. Are there differences such as to exclude them from our frame of belonging or are they unimportant? Do they threaten our sense of physical or psychic well-being? Can they be mobilized in our attempts to dominate a situation, perhaps only by substantiating previously asserted truths or taken for granted assumptions on the behavior of certain groups? Um, examples of this may be related to the Jewish landlord who does not fix the broken pipes in my apartment, the faculty of color who votes down a white job candidate only to support another woman of color for the position, the white evangelical Christian in the city council who votes against the change in zoning laws that would permit the building of a mosque in his, neighbor, in his neighborhood. In all of these cases and endless others, it is fair to assume that our group membership, Jewish or not, person of color or not, Christian or not, will influence how we make sense of, how we frame, ultimately, what meanings we assign to the actions of the other person. All too often, the psychic cost in discomfort that we would pay for questioning or revising our categories is generally quite beyond us. For a, um, let's say for a Jewish person in France, living with rising anti-Semitism, with rising tensions between Jewish and Muslim communities, to accept the explanation that the murder was caused by a, the fact that the man was mentally ill rather than he was Muslim, would involve too much of a giving. It's much easier just to reduce it to a racial or religious prejudice. And we do this all the time. Um, the emotional toll would not simply be that of a cognitive shift of perspectives, um, prejudice against certain groups, Jews, Roma, Blacks, Alevis, and others, is often part of a well-articulated system of world maintenance. You see this a lot in the Balkans, in the relations between the Alevi and the Sunni Muslim community. You see it a lot. Um, take away this keystone of how we make sense of the world. The whole system is threatened. Reason enough not to doubt the impurity of Alevis if we are Sunni Muslims, or of Roma if we are Caucasian Eastern European, the rapaciousness of Jews if we are a certain type of Christians, or the infer inferiority of Blacks if we are whites of certain racially prejudicial views. But the threat goes beyond these building blocks of our constructed universe. 
For by questioning my categories, by doubting or revising my social representations, I am also shaking the foundations of my group membership. As social representations are first and foremost social, that is shared by my in-group, by questioning them, I am inter alia questioning my group membership, the terms of my collective being, and so the very foundations of my social self, the me in George Herbert Mead's locution. Here we come to the famous insight by George Gregory Bateson on meta messages. How every message is both a message about the world and a message about the message. The message of a promise, for example, is both a message about something I commit to doing or not doing, as well as the retrieval of the very concept of the promise as a specific form of locution. I am both promising and activating the frame of promise making at the same time. Thus Basin reminds us that it is, in, quote him, quoting him, it is important also to exchange meta messages by which we tell each other what order and species of unconscious or consciousness attaches to our messages. Stepping away from the received opinion of our group by refusing to articulate those shared presupp presupposition, presuppositions, even just eternally, which tell us not only something about the other, but something about us, the group as well, subjects us to more than group opprobrium. It profoundly upsets our sense of self and challenges our relation to the world. Remember years ago, I go to synagogue every morning, 6.30. And I remember years ago when there were um, horrible bombings of um, Shia mosques by Sunni and reciprocal, reciprocal terrorist attacks in the Muslim world. And um, a member of my synagogue turned to me and said, he was, a, he was a major figure in the community and said something like, um, and said something, I don't remember, but something like, I know why they kill us, but why are they killing one another? And I was really incensed and I wanted to say, are you here to pray to, pray to God or to talk against another people? And I didn't do it. 6.30 in the morning, I didn't want to have a fight. But why didn't I do it? Because had I done it, I would have been moving myself outside of the community just as we're going to stand up to pray together. And there was a tension. And I didn't want to face it at 6.30 in the morning. I didn't have the courage. I don't think I'm exceptional. <laughs> I think this is the kind of thing many of us do most of the time. There are other times where I do. But this time I didn't. And Obviously, I still feel shame and guilt about it. I didn't do what was right to do because doing it would have broken that shared frame. You see what I'm saying? And this is the problem when politics and religion become together, joined together. It's a different issue. <clears throat> this social aspect, myself and this gentleman, of who we are is indeed one of the most difficult of concepts for many to accept but it stands at the basis of sociology and the existence of society, right? Society, as Durkheim taught those of us who went to school many years ago, is a reality sui generis. And the representations which express it are wholly different from contents of purely individual ones. Um, these are the forms through which we present ourselves to ourselves and how we become who we are. Um, in this way, they're connected to our sense of group belonging, a belonging that plays a role in both assessing the in-group as well as out-group members, and in so doing, defining for us our place in the world. I didn't want to become a member of the out-group at that synagogue at 6.30 that morning. Didn't want to do it. Didn't have the courage. One does not need to be a social psychologist to recognize how important is the family, our primary group, to our notion of who we are. Replete as a family is, as each family is, with its own histories, stories, myths, foods, memories, tragedies, joys, jokes, and so on. Nor indeed do we need to be professional social scientists to recognize how the values, beliefs, norms, rules, prejudices, 
strictures and lessons learned in our family continue to inform our reading of the world. For it is them we are revolting against, if we revolt against them, rejecting and defining ourselves in different terms. The continued saliency of this social self in defining our attitudes and decisions um, is evident in one of the continual problems of most programs divining, designed for conflict re resolution and peace building. Such programs as Seeds of Peace, which take young Palestinian and Israelis to rural Maine for a summer of intense interaction and work of mutual recognition and validation have a great success as long as the participants remain in, Bain, in Maine. However, when they return to Tel Aviv and Jenin, the gains in mutuality, or at least the extension of these lessons beyond the particular projects, participants are lost. That is to say, Chaim may remain with strong positive views of Ahmed and vice versa. But once back home, it is difficult to extend these views towards other Palestinians or Israelis as the case may be. Taking individuals out of their social context and emphasizing what is similar to them as individuals does not ultimately address what is so very different to them as members of groups involved if we're talking about Palestine now in a hundred year old bloody conflict because the extreme consequences of depersonalization and then dehumanization in the 20th century have been so horrific, the common move in intercultural and conflict resolution work has been to focus on the individual and see the individual and Zish as such, rather than view him or her as a member of a group. The programs which succeed in this, however, then face the fact that on returning to their home environments, this perspective cannot be sustained because of the strong shared group assumptions of the collective one returns to as the individual re-enters re his or her group of belonging and is surrounded internally and externally by its social representations of themselves and of the relevant others, the ability to maintain a purely individualistic reading of reality is destroyed. This should not be surprising, and it is unrealistic to believe that the social representations of our own groups can be overridden for more than brief periods of time. Am I clear so far? You can take people out of the group. You can build a wonderful month summer program. What happens when they go back to Janine? What happens when the Israeli brother soldier is involved now, as is happening just recently in the in the repressive actions in Janine and the and the and the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of wounded? Of course, even in the normal run of things, there are moments when the individual aspects of self, relatively free from social representation, emerge supreme, usually moments of extreme joy or pain, or perhaps a greater appreciation of beauty. But they are not quotidian, and indeed they cannot be. Thus, the challenge remains on how to dispel or at least mitigate prejudice, even while recognizing that group sense, which is an essential aspect of who we are. None of this would be a problem if we lived in relatively isolated and homogeneous communities where we are not challenged by continual encounters with difference, but this is not the case, nor was it ever. We are almost always everywhere, a mix of different religions, races, ethnicities, clans, and peoples. In this situation, the individual deviations from our normative expectations can, as we have seen, be accommodated either through some claims of exceptionalism, ah, he's a good Jew or what have you, um, that do not challenge our normative order or through the addition of further bits of information that explain the anomaly, why they're different from our assumptions. By explain, we mean situate the behavior or ideas of said individual within our existing preconceptions, even if they do not accord to them. Ah, Ahmed seems a very reasonable person with clearly liberal ideas about women the political use of violence, the role of Islam in a multicultural society, as well as deep commitment to the democratic process. It does not fit my preconceptions at all that all Muslims are terrorists. Ah, but he did study at Boston College, a Jesuit institution, and that must be why he's different from other Muslims. This is what I'm saying that we do all the time, right? That's, that's why he's different. Generally, by such methods, most of us, most of the time, can both maintain our vision of the world, all Muslims are terrorists, and at the same time accommodate individual idiosyncratic differences we experience. Ahmed was this really cool guy. Right? This is, however, not the case in respect to groups. 
for the move to reassess our assumption about groups as a whole, let's say those we're in conflict or competition with, from our experience with a limited number of, of individuals would threaten the sense of our own group distinction and with it the superiority of our group over others. This, the inherent ethnocentrism of groups um, is a critical aspect of group membership and so of our own sense of self. It is this that prevents us from recalibrating our views of the other group in line with our own individual experience. So you see what I'm saying? I could make an exception for Ahmed, but I can't or I won't recalibrate my view of Muslims because that would threaten uh, where Jews were better. That's too difficult to do. Ahmed, I can find a way. Yeah, he went to, Jesus, to, to a Jesuit school. But when I'm faced with a group, that's too threatening to myself and my group membership. We're thus thrust into a situation of cognitive difference where a change to our frame of meta meanings is too threatening to our sense of self, while at the same time our present experience contradicts these very meta meanings, which willy nilly bring, we bring to every experience. The result is discomfort, which is, if you remember where I started. What I am arguing for here is precisely for us to live with this discomfort, to abide with it, not to rush to resolve it in one of the various ways that the mind presents. All too often the desire to resolve the discomfort can lead us to totally erase the group that has caused it. This is the dynamic behind the horrors perpetrated by that narcissism of small difference that Sigmund Freud drew our attention to 100 years ago. It is precisely the small difference that challenges our sense of self, that is of our self in group in a manner that totally other does not, right? Um, if I'm living in, in Massachusetts, the Chinese Buddhist doesn't challenge who I am, but um, the American Muslim maybe does because they're like me in so many ways, but not in this way. And it's that small difference that's threatening to, to me, precisely because it's the small difference. We can sim symbolically dis dismiss the totally other without a threat to our self-conception. We could... The near other, on the other hand, he or she defined solely by the small difference cannot be so easily erased without such a move threatening ourselves as well as we share so much with them. Hence, what we do is we replace the small difference with a large unbridgeable difference. And then we can dehumanize the other. And this we've seen in the 20th century again and again and again. From Indonesia to Germany, to Russia, to America, to wherever you're looking. What I am arguing for here then is neither succumbing to the catharsis of enacted aggression nor the mental feints of explaining away cognitive dis dissonance, nor even the rejection of our sense of self and group belonging in light of the challenge posed by our experience. I can continue to be a good Baptist or Shona or Jew or Muslim or Black American, and also realize that much of what my grandmother taught me about Catholics or Nebelis or Goyim or Jews was actually wrong, and simply based on what Francis Bacon termed so many centuries ago, the idols of the tribe. Doing so, however, necessitates being willing to exist with a certain degree of discomfort. And it is that, as counterintuitive as it may seem, that I'm argue, arguing for here, a willingness to live with discomfort. Here then, we must turn to the idea of bearing or suffering discomfort and refusing the attractive as well as facile incorporation of what is truly different into our already existing categories and conceptions. If what was tolerated in medieval law was the very existence of Jews and prostitutes, which is true, I am suggesting that we refine our term to mean that we tolerance, we refine our understanding of tolerance as living with our own discomfort. Just as the third grader struggles with the discomfort of a new problem in arithmetic or spelling, we must learn to live with that discomfort and not throw away the pencil and run away in a fit of rage. Moreover, and just as by not throwing the pencil down and running away, the young boy or girl learn, learns to move beyond the self-evident calculations of addition and subtraction to the more complicated procedures of multiplication and division and fractions and so on, we too, through abiding with living with our discomfort, 
and learn to move beyond the contradictions that prefigured it. To be clear, moving beyond the contradictions does not necessarily mean resolving them, nor erasing them. It does, however, involve challenging our attitudes towards both contradiction and discomfort, to understand them as simply part of our life with people rather than as problems to be overcome or resolved. As a wise psychiatrist from New York, Theodore Rubin once remarked, the problem is not that there are problems. The problem is expecting otherwise and thinking that having problems is a problem. One way to, to potentially move beyond such a frame of meaning is to begin to understand the discomfort forged by those contradictions existing between our categories and our experience and learning to suspend judgment. To remain in a, in a state of suspended judgment is always risky and difficult. It means we refuse to predict others' behavior. We submit ourselves to a hiatus in explanation, meaning, and judgment. It's difficult. It is an extremely difficult and exhausting exercise, for it involves a suspense of meaning and an appreciation that our understanding of a situation is incomplete, doubtful, and problematic. Hence, of course, the discomfort. This suspension of judgment and consequently the parenthesis we must place around our pre-existing categories and prejudices is the cause of no little discomfort. We much prefer the certainty of knowing and so of being able to slot our experience into our already formed conjectures rather than the painful possibility of having to rethink our conjectures. That in matters of group identities and group judgments, these conjectures are social representations as well, make such attitudes all the more challenging. For by suspending judgment, I risk alienating myself from my group of belonging as I no longer invoke our shared social representations in my explanation of reality. My story I told you about the guy in synagogue, right? Exactly. Bearing in mind the extent of these challenges, it makes good sense, I would think, to recognize that we must learn to bear the discomfort of judgment suspended. We must learn to abide by, to suffer the discomfort of having no ready-made conceptualization of another's behavior or being. No box of categories at hand with which to frame our interaction, but rather an openness to process, to the true dialogical turn to the other that Martin Huber once described and whose outcomes cannot be known in advance. This is a tall order. And it may be that the necessary propedeutic, the necessary preparation for such, can only be found in religion, in traditionally defined culture. Such Islamic notions as khilm, humility, Judaic notions of epistemic modesty, Christian injunctions against pride, all would seem to point in this direction. The humility occasioned by knowing the limits of what can reasonably be known is a fair start to living with the discomfort of the other in their real presence. Transcendence helps. Thank you very much for your patience. Questions? Thank you, Professor. You may have a seat while listening a question from Lord. Are you I'm sitting, yeah. Just okay. Take a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you uh, once again, Professor. So, uh, so it's not. Okay, uh, we already heard uh, an extensive uh, explanation from Professor Seligman on uh, the difference on uh, existing uh, knowledge known as uh, prejudice in social science and also on a group uh, belonging that uh, all affect the way we see the word 
and also interact with uh, them. Uh, and the I think the uh, Professor Seligman offer uh, I, I don't know a solution or or what that we uh, should uh, live uh, uh, with difference, not uh, emphasizing uh, what what we can share, yep. Prof. But we deal with with just uh, the mere difference that may produce uh, uncomfortability or inconvenience uh, among us by i think the in the last uh, the last uh, lecture professor segment mentioned about humility confessing our limits of knowledge so uh, we 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 know that we uh, our judgment on others may may be untrue or incomplete because we have uh, incomplete information about them but uh, in any social sense uh, the prejudice i remember gadamer also talk about uh, prejudice as the basis of uh, knowledge uh, actually so but i'm curious how can your uh, professor seligman before i invite the audience to give a response or raise a, a questions how your uh, perspective can make a real contribution to establishing peace for example in in uh, in the long uh, uh, conflict such as uh, in israel between uh, israeli and uh, palestinians for example how can uh, your uh, your offering to uh, to uh, ask or to to that people should uh, acknowledge the difference as a fact yeah, as the reality can contribute to that especially in 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 case that uh, the government political interests uh, determine uh, this process of establishing uh, peace harmony among uh, society okay so uh, also the second second question from me how uh, you how you try make sense of the national anthem that <laughs> that we sang at the at the opening uh, ceremony the first time you uh, hear uh, along uh, 40 years you give lecture everywhere right okay thank you maybe i'll stand <laughs> okay <laughs> okay okay so, so. okay and the uh, okay thanks <laughs> audience uh, please prepare your best uh, question for uh, for uh, uh, professor seligman also on online participants uh, i like to invite uh, you to prepare uh, comments or question uh, to professor seligman let me try to answer your first question. I'll pass on the second one. So the problem of Israel and Palestine is a political problem that I believe can only be solved politically. And the only viable political solution at this point, I think, sadly, is one state, democratic, secular, from the Jordan to the sea. In other words, what Arafat claimed all, is, all throughout the history of the PLO. Um, I don't think that's possible at this stage, um, but I think that's the, on, the only political solution is a democratic society in that whole area from the, from the Jordan to the sea where everybody is a citizen. Um, to achieve that, which will not be in, our in any of our lifetime, what's needed is to get beyond where we are now, yeah? which means the development of some minimal degree of trust, yeah? So what I'm suggesting and what I'm presenting here, not a political solution, is a prerequisite for a political solution. So for instance, there are various attempts in Israel now, both, with, both among Jews and Palestinian citizens of Israel, as well as with greater difficulty 
with um, Palestinians in the, in the occupied territories to come up with an idea of um, one land, two states, two states on the same land. And it's very difficult to establish the necessary trust between the partners to do that. What I think I'm presenting is a set, and I, I mean, I, we didn't go here into the details, a set of practices that can possibly contribute to that, to that trust. Now, if I'm going to live in discomfort a different way, I don't know you, I've never seen you, I know nothing about you, to trust you means to be in discomfort, right? It's not like trusting my daughter, right? It's not like trusting my daughter. Um, so how do I prepare myself for that discomfort? That's what I'm talking about, right? So you have to be willing to trust an enemy, to trust an enemy, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable, at least in the first steps. And then, you know, if you can walk a few steps together, you can begin to get some more. Some more. Let me tell you an Indonesian story that happened to me, okay? I won't mention names, but it's an interesting story. So more than 10 years ago, we did our first program in Indonesia, not with our current, um, our current partners. Our partners will remain nameless. And th this actually is the bag from the um, program in Bulgaria. In 2011. The design, the design, can everybody see the design? The design is from a minaret in Solos. Solos is a city, small town in uh, Herzegovina, in Herzegovina. The program either began in Bosnia, and this is from a minaret in Solos. No, no, the Sashika Mosque is a part of a different story in Saudi Arabia. Um, there were 11 mosques in Solas. All of them were destroyed during the war. Not just destroyed, the, 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 the stones were taken and thrown, thrown in riverbeds. And in one place, um, a priest came and roasted a pig on the side of the mosque so that they couldn't throw the mosque back. Okay, the people began to, to rebuild. This had great significance for us. Um, given the program procedures from a marketing stage. Now, you can see that the, the six point star, which is left by the Jewish star, is a common Islamic symbol in the Balkans. No idea about the Jewish, but I would say that in the Balkans, it's a common Islamic symbol. Okay. So, every summer school, we have a program, and we make a bag, and we. No? So, when we did the. When the our colleagues in Indonesia did the back. This middle of the of this design was sort of the red. It was sort of blurred. No problem. Two years later, I was in Jakarta and I gave a lecture and um, by chance, purely, purely by chance, the um, Indonesian gentleman who had run that program with us was at the Institute where I gave the lecture. And so he came, and so he came to the lecture. And it wasn't this in a big room, it was in a smaller room around the table. He gave a lecture. And it was hot, I took my hat off like right now. And then at the end, after it was done, he said, oh, let's take a selfie. Take a, a selfie with me. I said, great, okay. And he said, put your hat on. Because the hat is your symbol, right? It's on the picture of me. The hat is, you're always with a hat. Now, what do I do? How do I interpret this? Is there a connection between putting a hat on and hiding the keeper and the fact that this was blurry? Are they just totally coincidental? What do I do with this? Now, I think it's not unreasonable on my part to think there's something going on. It's not just one event, it's two events. The question is what you do with that. How do you live with that? And live, so first of all, remember, I'm advocating here suspending judgment. 
judgment is, ah, this wasn't a printing error. This was on purpose. And he didn't tell me the truth. Ah, it wasn't because my hat is a symbol of Adam, but because he didn't want a picture together with me, with me and a keeper. Then I would be sure and I can put it in a box. It's maybe a box that's not friendly. I have no idea what's the, I really have no idea what's the truth. But I want to say that the normal person most of the time does that. And it's a struggle not to. It's a struggle not to because I don't know. And it's now years later and I still don't know. Living with that knowledge, the last term I used was suspended judgment. And suspended judgment leads to discomfort. And that's what I'm talking about. So I don't know. I can't resolve it. And next time when I meet him and if we do a project together, which I'm sure we won't, um, I cannot pretend that I won't ever think of this, but I don't have to let it totally define our next interaction. That's all I'm saying. And so I'm saying to get to a point where you can make the political moves that are necessary to make in Israel constant, you need to develop this type of approach for it. Because the solution is political here. Clearly, the solution is political. And this little story that I tell you has no blood, no dead. Furnish with furnish, nothing. No, you have dead, like, you know, knee deep, neck deep on both sides. It's not easy. So the question is how you begin to start. So for instance, in, in Israel proper, there are a number of mixed cities. The only one that is um, pretty livable is Haifa, because in 1948, the Palestinian elite was not destroyed. So there's a, there was a Palestinian, there is a Palestinian elite in intelligentsia in Haifa. So there is a coherence to the community. In many other cities, they were destroyed. In Israel proper, I'm talking about 48. And two of those cities are Lod and Ramla. Ramla, by the way, has the largest Dawa center in the world in Ramla. Um, and they're mixed cities. And a year ago, there were horrible riots um, between the Jews and the Arabs in this mixed city. So people now are contacting me to maybe we can do use some of the um, practices that you develop in Lod and Ramla um, in these mixed cities. So I said, great. That's one. I just had a Zoom meeting two weeks ago. I said, great, our next program, send two or three people. The program will do in Africa. So they begin to understand what we do and we'll see. I have no other way. I know it's no, I know it's labor intensive. I know it's time intensive. I don't know any other way, except force and I'm a coward. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, that's very loud. <laughs> Thank you again. Uh, Thank you again, Prof. Uh, Seligman, for a very rich and a comprehensive lecture. Uh, uh, it's inevitable for me to uh, to relate your uh, rich uh, lecture with uh, personal experience. So, and I think that's probably the most important message in in your lecture. Also, how to relate those uh, process of uh, learning about differences and whether we are in denial of differences or we are able to live with discomfort. Uh, among differences of different individuals, different groups. And I keep uh, resonated with uh, my own uh, upbringing because uh, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Sundanese, for example, ethnic uh, Indonesian in West Java. And we, we do have uh, education from my mother, from my father, from grandmother's side of my mother or my father about certain uh, concepts. Like you said, it, this is a, the frames that, uh, what we call it? The education, yeah. That uh, we learn names, 
We learn groups, other groups, our own groups through that education at the families. And then they told us about a lot of things. We also learned from a religious school about categories, about names. And that's how we built our own frame, if I can understand your lecture like that. And so the, the, main, the basic uh, understanding about differences is coming uh, from education, family education, school or religious education. And I wonder th those kind of uh, framework that we had throughout our lives is already, you know, uh, construct our definition on things and categories in your lectures. And it's really difficult to deconstruct. It's really difficult to change. I, I wonder if, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but to, 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 you know, to apply what you said about how we can live in differences, how we can, uh, you know, live and abide with discomfort, what kind of attitude we, we have to have in, in terms of like living with differences. Because like, for example, I learned from my experience in Australia, for example, very small examples. In Indonesia, we don't really, uh, uh, not socialize, we don't really uh, get along well with dogs, for example, yeah. We, because our parents think no, dogs is haram, for example. Najis, for example, yeah, like that. And then when I go to Australia, a lot of my best friends, are considering dogs as family members. When I come to their house, the dogs are just the most friendly uh, members of the family, hugging us, like licking us and things. And then I learned to, uh, at first I, I felt very discomfort about that. Because, oh, I have to clean it, clean up my uh, shoes, my, yeah. <laughs> but later on I find a, uh, explanation within our religion itself or you actually don't need to go uh, too far on like cleaning dog's lick for example dog saliva you just need like uh just uh, use water and dirt that's pretty easy <laughs> we can find dirt anywhere we can find water anywhere so like those experience really change a lot but for people mostly living in Indonesia, doesn't go out much. Don't experience like we, we earlier discussed about how people living in their own groups, only with people with similar uh, opinions, similar uh, ex, uh, concepts, similar categories. And it's really difficult to drag them or to make them out from that framework. And I think that's, uh, represent most or majority of Indonesian. I wonder what kind of changes that we need to, uh, you know, to make this individual or groups able to grasp that differences. Thank you very much. It's a great story about the dogs. It's a great story. You know, um, I'll tell you a story back before I answer your question and answer your question. So, um, you know, two of the most important moments in life are birth and death. You know? um, and it's not a coincidence that people who are not religious at all, when it comes to those two moments, they follow to some extent the precepts of their religious tradition. Right? And um, in, in Judaism, people who are buried immediately, immediately, um, in the simplest way. There is just a simple cloth. In America, they need a coffin, but you're supposed to be dust to dust. So there are holes on the bottom of the coffin. So you touch the, the body touches the ground. There is tahara, like in Islam, there's tahara of the body. Um, and um, it's done. 
And I learned that this was, learned growing up, that this was the way to honor the dead. And anything else was dishonorable. And um, we had neighbors, Catholics. He was Irish, she was Italian. And their daughters, my daughter played together. And the grandfather died. And the grandfather died. And um, so there was an open casket Irish wake. So, right, there was this big funeral home. There were hundreds of people, all Irish faces. And the, um, the dead grandfather was, everybody passed in front of the, the casket. And, and I did too. And I realized my mother was wrong. This is also a way to honor the dead. It's not our way but it's their way, yeah? It's no less respectful than anything we do. Who do we think we are? This is just our way. So I think we can learn, um, so that the stories are not the same, but they're both about the, not the erasing, but the changing, right? Your story and my story, how we learned that, ah, what we learned when we were kids are not exactly God's words, you know, <laughs> verse, chapter, and verse. Yeah. Everything is always interpretation, and they change over time, interpretations. Anybody who knows the tradition knows the tradition changes over time, just as we change over time <laughs> as we get older. Um, so we learn that things aren't absolute. We learn that, um, I think when we're younger, we, we sort of see everything as very clear. We get older, we realize it's, there's much more ambiguity in the world that we kind of have to find our way in and around the ambiguity, never losing meaning totally, but accommodating the complex, the infinite complexity of the world. And that's the meaning of creation, right? What we create is not infinite. It's a table, it's here. What God created is infinite. Um, so we learn just like a craftsman person, a plumber, an electrician, a roofer, over 40, 50 years, they learn a craft and they can't explain it in words. That's why you become an apprentice to somebody to see how they do it. Um, one, of the, one of the big changes in, in religion, um, certainly in Judaism, but I think in Islam as well, is um, the move to more and more written texts explaining what to do. 70 years ago, how did you learn how to pray? How did you learn in Judaism how to do Salat? How did you, you went to the synagogue and you see what people did and they don't do exactly the same, right? This one bows like this, this one bows like this, this one goes to the left, it's different. Once it's written down, so Allah. Right? Once it's written down, it's a text. This text is from God. No, it's not. But that's our attitude towards text. And so religion begins to change, becomes more homogeneous, becomes more stance-like. But it wasn't this way 100 years ago. It wasn't this way 50 years ago. So we're losing that. We're losing that um, lability. Um, in answer to your question, you answered it yourself. What people need is the experience of difference. The experience of difference, not coming somebody coming and giving a lecture about it, not reading a book about it, but experiencing it. And that's the program that I've been doing for 20 years now. So we're bringing people from China, from Bulgaria, from America, I don't know, from nine different countries to, 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 to Indonesia on Sunday um, to be here for two weeks. And this is what we do all over the world. I know it's nothing. I know it's just a teeny, teeny, from, from Kenya, from Uganda. I know it's just a teeny little bit, but I don't know how to do anything else. This is all I know how to do. But if you choose the right people and then their community leaders, then they can further such things within their own communities. I don't see another way. To, I really don't see another way to do it. I think that the only meaningful learning is what you said in Australia is your experience. Yes, is experiential learning. 
So you, you gave the answer yourself how to do it. There's no algorithm. It's going to be different in Indonesia and Bulgaria and Kyrgyzstan and Cyprus and Palestine and Kenya and uh, Japan and so on. And so on. Right? Yeah, but it, but but but, but, but it, yeah, but the problem is if you go as, a, as an individual, then then the experience is individual, and the importance is to recognize the groupness of who we are and who the other is, and encountering that groupness. That's the challenge, and being willing to do that. Yes. Yeah, it must be groups. Yeah, it's not the nation state, but it must be groups. Yeah, was that a decent answer? Then, uh, Pa Iqbal. Okay, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Seligman. Uh, uh, I was struggling uh, connecting your lecture with uh, what uh, I already know with my preconception, but. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that I try to resist or to reject your opinion. Uh, I think uh, understanding also requires uh, connecting uh, new information with our uh, preconception. And uh, regarding uh, categorical thinking, uh, I think uh, first, when we don't observe the reality by our own eye, uh, then we use language. And also we think, we do reasoning in language. And the nature of language is, or the nature of words is categorical again. And then uh, the size of the category uh, uh, also determines uh, the cost of cognitive energy. So if, if we want to, if we don't like to think a lot, then we use broader uh, category. But uh, the broad category is often uh, creates problems in the world. Uh, so uh, just what you have answered uh, by Lily's question is that uh, we can revise our conception only by seeing uh, the reality by our, our own eyes, by experiencing. And then uh, secondly, what make... Uh, Category categorical thinking is also because uh, uh, we develop our identity and also the legitimacy of our being by constructing yeah uh, a kind of view which we construct with using language and also by uh, uh, so it is also socially constructed you know? and also we need the uh, intersubjective confirmation and also social belonging. And our community also will control what what is allowed and what is not. And uh, regarding uh, the issue of sharing similarity, sometimes uh, sharing a lot of similarity doesn't imply that we will uh, we can easily get along with each other. Uh, for example, uh, for example, Muslim relatively have no problem with Buddhist, for example, but with Christian. And with uh, with Jews, we share a lot of teaching actually because uh, yeah we have uh, the same prophets for example. But uh, yeah, can create problem because we compete uh, about the same truth actually, uh, or uh, compete for the legitimacy of our religion because we talk uh, we have similarity here, and uh, even more clear. Our competition, our Sunni competition, not my competition, with CE competition is much stronger than Muslim or Sunni with uh, Jews or uh, CE with Jews. So similarity sometimes also uh, sharing major similarity when we still have a difference sometimes can give uh, intense problem. So please uh, give comment about that. Thank you very much. Last thing mentioned by Pak Iqbal actually is a family feud. Okay, it's more violent, more conflictual than conflict with other uh, parties. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So, kind of agree with everything you said. But what the, the this last examples are exactly what Freud meant when he talked about 
a narcissism of the small difference, right? Buddhism is not the problem to Islam. Christianity is. And as you just said, Shia is more of a threat, cognitive threat, than, than is Christianity. That's exactly what Freud wrote about in civilization and its discontents, because precisely because the difference is small, then it's such a threat. If the difference is large, it's not a threat. It's just a di- unless you know unless there are tanks involved, it's just it's a different world. It's not a threat. So I, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, I want to relate more to the first things you said. I tried to get my, my university a number of years ago. I wanted to build a um, interdisciplinary curriculum. So what I so I tried to build one, which was exactly breaking down the big categories, sociology, anthropology, so on, into small mosaics, small little pieces that we would put together in a different way, like around the problem, and then use the different disciplines to answer the problem. And you could involve everybody in it. Like you could talk about a problem with the city and people would have to know Spanish and they'd have to know sociology and anthropology and linguistics and engineering and so on. I was literally laughed out of the room because it was a lot of work, as you said, because doing this really was a lot of work. And what the idiots at my university did is they took three syllabuses, they stapled them together and they said, here you go. This is an interdisciplinary curriculum, it's nonsense, it's nonsense. So yeah, now, but the thing is, I agree with you that to understand I have to, I have to assimilate the new to what, to, to, to what I already have. That's a bad paraphrase of what you said very, very nicely. But I also have to be willing to let it change me the way the story of the dogs in Australia changed. So it's not that, oh, dogs are not haram. It's not, oh, I can kiss the dog from now till forever. It's not everything that I was taught in my Islamic tradition and my family is nonsense. So I'm, on the one hand, in, in your story, you're assimilating it. it, 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 it it's, it's not pure. Um, but maybe my attitude towards impurity, of, or at least this type of impurity, can change. I don't throw it away, but I just change it. So what I'm saying is that, um, that yeah, you're right. You have to be, the only way I can understand the world is assimilating it to my existing categories. But I have to at least be open to have my categories change. Not throw away, not destroy but change. To have that openness, I have to suspend judgment. I have to be willing to be uncomfortable, at least for a certain period of time. That's my point. And in the program that we've been running now for more than 20 years, the notion is through this program, you learn to see yourself, to see the other, and to see yourself seeing the other. So you learn to get some reflective distance. And through that, hopefully we can modulate our categories, not throw them away, but not be determined to impose them hook, line and sinker sinker on everything. We learn to modulate them. And I think that's the only way we learn. I mean, how does a scientist develop? How does science develop? You have um, presuppositions, right? Um, based on accumulated experience of your work and that of other scientists, but you experiment and you're willing to have the experiment challenge your existing assumptions. How does medicine progress? It learns that its previous conceptions of disease or cure can be changed. So it's that back and forth. Now this becomes very real Let's say when we look at immigrant experience, and this is actually why the people in Japan are using our program, but if you look at Europe, so what's happening is in Scandinavia, um, 
the government is forcing a certain model of what being Swedish is on children, let's say, who are Muslim. So they have to have certain instruction in Christmas carols. It's not willing to say, ah, maybe you can be Swedish and Muslim rather than Swedish and Christian and Muslim as some tolerated minority. Maybe we could understand Swedishness, Swedish, Swedishness in a much more capacious manner. This was the problem of Jews in Europe, right? They were a foreign body and were treated as a foreign body and were exterminated as a foreign body rather than you can be French and Jewish. So this notion of maybe we can open up our categories through the experience of this individual meeting, this one and this one and this one and this one. So yes, you're assimilating, but you're also changing. And if you're not, then you're just exercising control, which at one point will move from symbolic control to physical control. And that sadly often leads to extermination. Okay, uh, um, the next, Bu Tung Yulan will raise a question. Oh, oh, you have already the mic. Okay, please, uh, Bu Yulan. Okay, thank you. Uh, try to continue about the competition with, uh, in the small difference. Uh, in the in the business area, uh, the one who's selling the same good is usually fighting with each other. But if you're selling different good, yeah, certainly not competition, right? <laughs> So I think that probably not because of the difference, the small difference, but because of the similarity too much, you know? So you intend to think that you cannot fight with the same, a similar with the son and uh, father, right? If you are your father, son, you have to compete with your father to reach the same goal. I think it's more difficult rather than if you try to choose different area. That's uh, one thing I just want to add to that argument. Uh, another thing uh, about, you mentioned about the physical that try to see others, okay. But how about the psychological? Because a lot of uh, the fighting usually or the prejudice or whatever, uh, the uh, that's related to the experience as well, but probably not related to the religious one. For example, um, I'm Chinese Indonesian, uh, the minority. A lot of people are angry with the Chinese because the experience of the parents or their themselves in the business. So they relate that one. So what I mean is that uh, we try to see also the trauma from what we have around in other area and try to relate to when we see the persons. Uh, so what I mean that psychologically, uh, I have problem too when we, are taught by parents to have a positive thinking all the time. Uh, I try to have develop a new strategy. When I meet a new person, I'm not saying you as a person that I know, like you said about daughter. So that's why I always have the suspicious, but it's not a bad suspicious, but we try to develop building the trust through that one, trying to collect all the good things and then building the relationship. Because my experience when I was uh, little, 
when I'm trusting people based on the parents' thought about other people is everybody good people. You shouldn't treat them as bad people. But I realized that I cannot do that because I do trusting at the beginning. And then suddenly a surprise. Behavior, uh, other people cannot be, uh, like you said, uh, suddenly unexpected. So I go the other way around, or like, like the people, the lawyer always said, and not guilty until proven guilty. I said, people should be guilty until proven not guilty. Why I said that? Because in building relationship, trust is starting from the strange thing. So you collect small thing that you slowly know and then building trust. Like for example, with my colleague, when I first met her, I don't know her. Uh, I try to have a distance, but later we have to connect each other and then, then try to learn a little bit about her. And then we building trust after years. That's uh, the Chinese way, in a way, like doing business, you know, you building, uh, you try to give your loan, small one, and to increase slowly. So I think, uh, but the problem that I want to ask, how to deal with the trauma of conflict? Uh, building trust is different. That's starting from peaceful, uh, situation but what happened when you are already in a conflict you have a trauma uh, that not only related to your self sometimes is more dangerous in when related to others because when i'm talking about chinese relation here in indonesia the older man point finger to me because i'm saying that the experience different from what they experience, what my experience, and also uh, younger generation experience about being Chinese in Indonesia. We have the 65 and 98 difference, you know. But the older insist that we have to experience what they experience. So that's why probably the problem is the control from the group. So the trauma that being inherited, that's more difficult. Uh, that's what I, I'm asking, I see. Thank you. Should we be here all day or all week? <laughs> um, let me try these are very, very important issues that you raise. They get more and more serious. Um, I start from the top and there was a very fine conflict sociologist, Louis Kozer, who said, Louis Kozer, who said, there's no conflict between French housewives and Chilean chess players, right? There's no conflict between them. You have to have some shared realm in order for there to be conflict. So I think that's, that's clear, we know that. We know that. Um, but I wanna say something else about similarity. I, I, because it was going on and on, I didn't, I, my lecture was going too long. I didn't go into Gregory Bateson, the fine anthropologist, who claimed something very, very important. And I think every generation goes back to Bateson. There's so much, so many rich insights in his writings. And he said, difference is information. Difference is information, right? You don't sit on the table, you eat off the table. Um, the beginning of civilization is difference. Categories are difference, right? 
categories are precisely the delineation of difference. Um, we know the world through making distinctions. Maybe the most important one, or certainly the first significant one, is when we're toilet trained. We can't go to the bathroom everywhere. This is the first huge major imposition of society on the individual. You can't just defecate and urinate wherever you want. It's huge, huge. Speaking of psychology. Um, there are places for it. I remember my eldest daughter when she was two, so she didn't wear a diaper, but um, when she had to go to the bathroom, she asked for the diaper to be put on and she went behind the curtain because she saw that her parents went to a special room. So she asked mommy or papi to put the diaper on and then she went in the living room and hid behind the curtain. She already knew you don't do this publicly. It was not yet too. Um, difference is information, which is why, and we know the world through making distinctions, which I believe is why you cannot have a world of similarities, including of similar people. So that what happens is, if we're all that same group of trees, then we might say, ah, but you're a cedar tree and you're a maple tree and I'm a pine tree. We're pine trees and you're maple trees. So we go from trees to distinctions because that's how we know the world. That's how we're hardwired to know the world. So that there will always be differences. There will always be differences. And I think the, the tragic flaw of world religions, certain world religions, is the attempt to impose homogeneity. We'll get everybody to be a Muslim. We'll get everybody to be a Christian. No, you won't. Because as soon as you start organizing, ah, there are heresies, there are sects, there are Eastern Orthodox, there are Western Orthodox, there are, I mean, look at Islam, right? I mean, you, you can, it cannot be other. It cannot be other. So this attempt to impose similarity, sameness, is doomed to failure, and it's generally doomed to tragedy. So I wanted to say that simply because we're hardwired to understand the world through making distinctions. So, and I think, I think we have to bear that in mind. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. I made the remark about the day or the week because the next two subjects that you raised are immense. And I can't go into them, I don't think. But I want to make a distinction that I think is important to start thinking about trust. And it's a distinction first made by the legal theorist and sociologist, Nicholas, Nicholas Luhmann, who distinguished between trust and confidence. Confidence is what I have when I know what to expect, or I think I know what to expect, when I can predict outcomes. And trust is what I need to maintain interaction if I do not know what to expect. All right, and I know what the knowing what to expect can be based on many things. Within the world of business, it can it can basically be based on sanctions, right? If you pay me thirty thousand dollars for the car and your check bounces, I can take you to court, all right? And if that system doesn't work, I could go and threaten to break your legs. Right? Those are two forms of sanctions, one formal and one informal, right? Um, I choose my plumber or my surgeon on the basis of many different things, right? I don't trust my surgeon. I hopefully have confidence in him because of the degrees on the wall from Harvard and Yale, and he has many years of experience. Um, at this point, with my age, I tend to have more confidence in an older person than a younger person, 
um, because I put more value on years of experience than I do on knowing just the latest study done in the journal, which will be true of the 30 year old and not of the 65 or 70 year old. Yeah. Unfortunately, all my doctors retire, so I have a problem, but that's, that's a different issue, right? But so confidence is based on the ability to predict, which can be formal or informal, right? And I can be right or wrong, right? I can be right or wrong about it. And I think most of our actions, certainly our actions in business are based on, on a great, these are ideal types, right? These are ideal types, right? Are based on a lot of confidence and a little trust, right? And so I think your story about doing business, not just as a Chinese woman, but as any business person, is slowly, I'll make a little bit of move and see if it's reciprocated. So it's slowly building confidence and only on the basis of confidence am I willing to make a jump, a leap into trust. So trust is what I need to have and trust is uncomfortable. No, let's have no, no, no qualms about this. Trust is uncomfortable because I don't know what will happen, all right? But sometimes if I want to get somewhere, I need to trust, all right? And the only way we can create something new is by trust. Confidence is, I give you this glass of water and you give me 10,000 rupiah. Nothing new has been created. Nothing new has been created. Tit for tat, this for that. And we're exchanging. We're exchanging within the world that already exists. When I fall in love with you, we begin to create something new, right? And that's already a huge trusting relationship, which can prove a mistake, right? We can be very, very hurt by it. This, otherwise, it's not trust, right? Otherwise, it's not trust. So I, I think that we always tend, it's a natural self-defense. We always tend to prefer confidence to trust, but we can't create anything new without trust. We can't create without trust. We can't create without giving, without getting back. That's the only way something new comes into the world or else it's just an exchange, right? It's just an exchange. I think we could rewrite Karl Marx's theory of surplus value in terms of a theory of love, but that's a different story. But I'm just saying that to develop this discussion of trust, um, I think it's important to start with that distinction and begin to look at where we have confidence, where we have trust, how we can move from confidence to trust. And in English anyway, people use the same words as if they're the same, but I don't think they're the same at all. You know, you can call them whatever you want. You can call them kuku miku and miku kuku. It doesn't matter to me the words, but they're two different social phenomena or two different interpersonal phenomena. And um, and I think it's it, it, it's, in many ways, um, there, there's some interesting work on medieval traders in the Mediterranean basin, basin, because in economics, this is very important. In economics, this is very important, right? Um, and so these trading networks were intergenerational, all right? So it's very similar to what you're talking about, 1965 and Chinese and so on, right? So the trust had to be it couldn't be total confidence because I'm not my grandfather and my grandchildren child is not me. So there's a basis of confidence based on, let's say, my wanting to maintain the good name of my family, established by my grandfather and great grandfather and father and so on. But when you're dealing with me, you know it's not the same as dealing with my great grandfather. Um, and you see this in business all the time, right? You see if you have a store in a neighborhood for generations, they have a basis of confidence in a family on which they're willing to give you credit without taking a mortgage or something like that because they know your family. They were at all your weddings, you were at all their weddings. You have a basis of confidence, so you're willing to give you the product or whatever it is without paying. Some stranger comes, excuse me, I want to check your credit card. I want to make sure that you'll pay my debt. So this is clear, this is clear. So we're always going between the two. And I think it's useful for understanding social reality 
to make the distinction, see where one and where's the other, and how can we move from confidence to trust? I don't think we can just trust, as you said, somebody steps from somewhere, somewhere I trust. Of course not. But at some point, if the relationship is gonna grow, we don't have to fall in love, but if the relationship is gonna grow, we have to get beyond confidence. And I think that's, that's the important thing. Okay, so here again, I think that what would be necessary and useful would be to, to devote a seminar to these, to, these, to these issues. And I think there's, there's a lot to be learned. Yeah, okay, <laughs> seminar. The last theme is the most important in some ways, which is inherited trauma. And most of us carry that. Most of us carry that. And I'm at this particular moment in time, very sensitive to it um, for various family matters and various things, both the programs that we're doing, both in Indonesia and in Hiroshima, which is connected to peace work and the dropping of the atom bomb. And my father fought the Japanese in World War II. So it's not like I'm not implicated, I am. And then Poland and Bulgaria, which is about the destruction of European Jewry, which my family were destroyed, were murdered. So all this is very real. And, and I, I don't know where to start. I, 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 um, in 1989, I think it was, or 83, in the wake of the Klaus Barbie trial in France, the Le Monde ran a, um, the, you know, the famous journal, the famous, um, you know, newspaper, ran a uh, questionnaire sort of thing. They said, when you think about the Second World War and the occupation, what word comes to mind? Justice? or forgetting. And I thought that's pretty interesting. The opposite of forgetting is not memory, but justice in the minds of Le Monde. And to me, this opens up a whole issue of what we do with this trauma that we carry, that we pass on to our children, that they take in their mother's milk, and how we deal with it. And is it for us to forgive something that happened, let's say, to our parents in our parents' generation? And how do we go forward? Um, and I I'm actually not comfortable talking about this in the abstract because I think this has to start with stories. So for me to be comfortable, it wouldn't be in this type of milieu. It would be sitting around a circle and sharing stories of a Jew in France in 1942, my family, of Chinese in Indonesia, of Japanese in Hiroshima and so on. And then seeing, okay, where do we go from here? Because I think it's, as I said, I think this is the most important, least academic of all the issues that, that you raised and you raised four terribly important issues. And um, I don't know. I don't know, I once gave a sermon, you know, one day a year, the holiest day in the Jewish year is Yom Kippur, the day of repentance. Um, when we fast for 27 hours, we all wear white like shrouds, we're all day fasting and praying. And, um, and uh, it, it, it's a day where we ask forgiveness from God for our sins, but our sins to one another, they have to be forgiven from the other person. God cannot forgive me for what I did to you. Only you can, which means I have to ask you for forgiveness, which is much more difficult than asking God. <laughs> it's much more difficult than asking God. Um, and I gave a sermon and I actually said, I think at the end, the only real forgiveness is forgetting. But how can that happen when we raise our children, even unconsciously, on our own trauma? 
and the trauma of our parents. So I think this is, this is the subject and there's no algorithm mathematical to write on the wall. Okay, this is what we do, we could go home now. <laughs> I, think, I think we have to start with stories. What? Time is sometimes healing. Sometimes it's burying. And the burying isn't healing, right? The burying isn't healing. And, um, you know, in French, there's the word non dit, what's not said. And what's not said sometimes ferments and ferments and ferments. And it might not come out in actions of the person, but it's passed on to the children. Um, my daughters are second generation of survivors of the war, and it defines who they are. I'm sorry, it defines who they were both born in the United States, nothing but what happened in Europe to their grandparents' generation defines who they are. And not in good ways. I don't mean, oh, we're Jewish. Not at all. They're both connect, you know, the, the one married a Catholic Pole and the other one is connected to a man from Lebanon and Iran. I mean, but in terms of their inner psychological being, this is who they are. And it's not necessarily healthy. So I'm saying, and, and my wife just, she kept it all inside. Kept all the trauma of the family inside, of being a refugee, whatever. So I, I'm saying these are, these are issues that if you take seriously, you don't deal with lightly. And that's why I think you need first to develop a little trust and a little confidence before you can start really sharing stories. Even though I think in some groups or societies, uh, intentionally reproduce the trauma to strengthen group uh, identity or, yeah. yeah I can give you an example. I can give you an example of Israel. In 1940s, 19, during the war, when the Jews in Europe, in Poland, in all of Europe, were being murdered, right? By the millions were being murdered. The attitude of the Jewish authorities, I mean, they didn't run the country, but of the Jewish movement in Israel was that it's more important to bring the people to Israel than to save their lives. Yeah. And now, and really they were not, they did not take responsibility to help the Jewish partisans, the Jewish resistance fighters who were fighting in the forest, in the Varsha, in the cities, they, they didn't help. Their, I was gonna, primary, almost only notion was how can we get as many people to Palestine? Not how can we save as many people as possible? And now the Auschwitz, the war is a huge propaganda thing for, for the Israeli government. Huge propaganda thing. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. That's exactly an example of what you're talking about. They're reproducing the trauma for a young generation where at the time, the people in Israel wanted nothing to do with, oh, those Jews in Europe, they're not like us. They're weak. They're frightened. Blah, 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 blah. They're religious. We're not interested. And now they wear an Israeli flag on their back and they go to Auschwitz. That's exactly, exactly what you're talking about. It's reproducing the trauma to establish hate towards the other, to build group belonging, and the hypocrisy of it, if you know what happened in the 1940s, the hypocrisy of it is absolutely mind-boggling. Mind -boggling. Yeah. Uh, we have a one uh, question from uh, online participants. I, 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 I will read the, the question from Mas Prabowo. Mas Prabowo is... Uh, Actually, it should be the moderator today, but I, I'm only the substitute. <laughs> okay, so I honor Mr. Prabowo by uh, reading his questions for you. Prof. Seligman, what is your opinion regarding the idea of tolerance or toleration? Well, this idea not only has various conceptions and levels, but also 
has been always in conflict, expressed uh, differently and debated because of the different of justifications, context, limits, norms behind it, and understanding of this concept. What uh, your opinion? So um, so at least in America, tolerance is seen as a um, insufficient virtue. Um, for me, tolerance is more than enough. <laughs> for me, tolerance is more than enough. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. But um, yeah, so tolerance is seen as inf is is seen as an insufficient virtue. We have to embrace difference. We have to dance with difference. We have to celebrate difference. I think that's garbage. I think that's true of minor differences that matter that do not matter. You like tennis, I like golf. I can celebrate your tennis. The Shia and the Sunni is a little more problematic than embracing difference. So I think that actually I've always, I started this work by working on tolerance intellectually years ago, um, because I think that's the most we can have. And I think it's enough. I think it's enough. Now, toler, tolerance, the root, the Latin root is toler. What's the cognate of toler? To suffer. Toler is you tolerate, you tolerate an illness, you tolerate a burden, you suffer with it. And in, I don't know about in Basa Indonesia, but in other languages, it's the same word. Um, or in, 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 in Semitic language, it's the same root. Um, Lisbol and Lisbol. Um, Sovlanut and Savlanut. Sovlanut is tolerant. Is Savlanut is tolerant. Sovlanut is bearing a burden. Um, in medieval in medieval canon law, I mentioned this on passant in the in the in the paper. In medieval canon law, there were two categories of people who were legally tolerated in medieval Europe: prostitutes and Jews. And the notion was, it would be much better if we could get rid of both of them, but we can't. If we get rid of prostitutes, people will be sleeping with one another's wives, and God forbid that can destroy society. And if we get rid of Jews, there'll be no, but they won't be here to recognize the second coming of Christ and who's going to do business with us in the meantime anyway. Like the Chinese, this is the problem of middlemen minorities, right? This is exact Chinese in, 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 in Indonesia, like Jews in Europe. But anyway, so they were, they were legally, these were two groups that were legally tolerated. We had to suffer their presence in, in canon law and church law. So I think we just should play with that notion a little and we get very quickly to my discomfort. We have to be, to really tolerate is to be uncomfortable. And what I'm claiming, what I try to claim in this whole lecture is it's preferable to be uncomfortable, to live in discomfort, which means to tolerate rather, rather than to subsume the other person in our own categories. That's what I'm trying to say. We have to tolerate that difference. That's always a challenge to me. That's why I have to tolerate it. It's like, you know, like a splinter in my finger. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Um, and so, yes, so I think we have to tolerate. We have to tolerate our own discomfort, the discomfort that that difference poses to me. Um, and, and what most people want to do, what happens in America all the time, and in Europe, I think this is Western culture, we say, yes, you're different this way, this way, but we're really the same. Yes, you might have your head covered and you might pray in a mosque and so on, but we're really the same. What am I saying when I say we're really the same? I'm saying you're like me. <laughs> Right? That's what's underneath my assumptions of sameness. When I say we're the same, the internal process is, I don't admit this to myself, but it means you're really like me. And I'm saying, no, let's live with the fact you're not like me. The difference, as they say, goes all the way down. And now I have to live with that difference. And that's what tolerance is. 
because to say we're the same in the end is always a lie. I'm turning you into me in my own in my own head. And that denies you. That's what I mean by erasing the other. I first erase you symbolically. And then when you refuse to be erased, I might erase you physically as well. So I hope that was an answer to that's the that's is that include uh, that in in the concept uh, of tolerance that you thought that we should uh, able to accept the difference even that i hate that difference for example or that's difference yes. something uh, unlawful in according according to my religion or 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 what Something could be unlawful. You don't have to hate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, uh, actually, this is the problem that uh, already mentioned by Bulilis. Okay, in Islamic tradition, most of uh, most of them, not all, okay, consider dog parts of uh, haram because the uh, najis it's uh, the saliva. But actually, there is Muslim Bulilis who uh, doesn't uh, regard. Uh, do not regard dogs as haram. Yeah. We know that uh, Professor Harun Nasution, uh, uh, professor at the State Islamic University, uh, long uh, years ago, that, uh, he he was he was he had a dog uh, in in his house. He and he, I think, was also a good Muslim. So, but most Muslim will see dogs still uh, uh, as haram so what should what should uh, we do you uh, avoid your neighbor who have dogs or you accept uh, your neighbors who has who have dogs for example you can accept and avoid at the same time how <laughs> or, or conversely, your neighbors who have dogs should respect your fellow uh, Muslim, for example, by not letting dogs uh, walking around in your neighborhood, for example. Ah, okay. Ah. <laughs> this is where the difference becomes interesting. Uh -huh. Exactly. Uh -huh. Not in your property, in my property, but that shared property. Yep. So what do we do in that shared property? Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is why I don't, this is precisely, this is, that, that is a great question. And this is precisely where I don't think there are algorithms, but there's an attitude. And we have to develop a certain attitude, for instance. So if I want to get together with my Muslim neighbors, let's say, to... Um, get the city to put more lights in the street so the drug dealers will go away. So I need to work with them to, uh, to, uh, to, to mobilize political pressure on the city, right? So what do I need to know about them in order to work with them with the city council? Do I need to know their attitude towards Tawit? Do I need there to know their attitude towards jihad? Do I need to know their attitude towards women? No, I need to know not to serve ham sandwiches when we come together to meet and not to schedule a meeting during Juma. That's what I need to know. Let's start there. Let's start there. A simple thing. And don't think this is a silly example. A number of years ago, I don't know now, maybe 15 years ago, I received a, an invitation from the United States Naval Academy to lecture on tolerance. And the day they chose was this holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. And I wrote to them, I said, I'm very honored that you asked me to come, but it's the holiest day of the year and I cannot come and give you a lecture. And, and they want the Jewish attitudes to tolerance. And they wrote back, thank you very much, Professor Seligman, can you recommend somebody else? And I said, no, it's the same problem. So, because all three, exactly, exactly. So it's it's not such a stupid example what, what I'm saying. So how do we find, so how do we find the, the way? Yeah, yeah, so how do we find the way? And I, I remember um, one of the first programs we did in Israel in 2005, 
in 205. So this was very interesting. We were sitting in a restaurant and one of the members was a, a very interesting man. He had been, um, he, we, he and I were then very friendly. He had been deputy prime minister of Bosnia during the war and minister of munitions. He's the one who organized the munitions generally from Iran that came to Bosnia to fight to fight in the war. Um, and he was um, he was a Sufi sheikh, and he was a very serious intellectual figure. He was a physicist. And we were all sitting in restaurants in different tables and wine was served. Now, the Balkans are the Balkans and Christians and Muslims live together for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's like the dog. So Rusmir didn't drink, but even Badach did drink. Not a problem, not a problem. But there was a young man, Palestinian, who recently found his faith. And his sheikh told him that um, it's impossible for you to sit at a table with wine. But he wanted to sit at the table with Rusmir. But there was wine on the table with Rusmir because Rusmir was good friends with Ivo, Ivo Banach, who was a, a, a very interesting, important historian, Catholic from uh, Croatia. And, um, and the young man was in a terrible, terrible dilemma um, because he wanted to sit with Rusmir, this great Bosnian hero and sheikh, but there was wine at the table and his own, the boy's own uh, sheikh from Nazareth told him that he's not allowed to do it. So in the end, he sat at the table with the children, which was the only table without wine. So I went and sat next to him so he wouldn't be alone with the children. But that was a problem. So the question is how, how you work these things out, how you work these things out, and you have to know. So, so you begin with having to know, and you said, for almost all schools, the dog is haram. Well, okay, but what is, what is the extent of the haram? What is, what are the different? Okay, let's say we all ex accept that category, pure, impure. But as you said, what are the ways of purifying? There might be there might be different ways of purifying, and you might accept it this way, and you might. Okay, so you know, I have a friend, Mustafa Bousway who is Al-Ghazali Professor of Islamic Studies at Birzit University, and he is on the waqf of the, of the, no, of the Dome of the Rock. He is, is a member of the waqf committee, and he came with the professorship. And, uh, and uh, Mustafa, he came to some of the programs. And uh, so again, it's written, it's written. I said, Mustafa, but it's all interpretation. So yes, we have the word of God clear, but it's given to human interpretation and human interpretation is fallible. It's not the word of God. The word of God is the word of God, but our interpretation is our interpretation and it changes. Why is there more than one school of law in Islam? Excuse me, right? Why is, why is the following of a Shafi different from a Hanabali? I mean, there are different interpretations. In Judaism, we believe that the good Lord gave us letters, not words. We made the words out of the letters and they can be divided differently. Then ultimately it's black fire on white fire. So, and he got very upset Mustafa because it, for him, once I say it's interpretation, it all falls apart. For me, no. Once it's interpretation, okay. So now we're part of an interpretive tradition that in my tradition goes back thousands of years. And every morning at 5.30 in the morning, I study it with my daughter by telephone before she goes out to work and before I go to synagogue. And I'm part of that tradition. And I'm aware of the conflicts within the tradition, the different interpretations of the tradition. And, the, and you have a sense of the living ijma of how a tradition develops, which is very different from saying it's written. So period, that's it. You have to do, which is... I mean this, I think. I think so. We can find a way to deal with. Okay, I'm your neighbor. I have a dog. I love my dog. I'm not going to low. I'm not going to let it bite you. Bite you. I'm not going to let it go onto your lawn. 
but I wouldn't let it go into you alone, even if you weren't a Muslim, because it's not right. You know, you know what I'm saying? That we don't have to go into in, academics will always go to sort of like the worst case scenario. No, there's a lot of way to go before we get to the worst case scenario, and we can begin slowly to build trust before we get there so that we have that in reserve when we get there. You see what I'm saying? If we have the interaction, if we have the interaction over time and the building of the confidence, then when, they, when the situation gets dangerous, maybe there's a little, a little trust, a little thing that can save somebody's life. In the end, it can save somebody's life. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, you know, we have already more than one hour <laughs> con uh, conversation with uh, two and a half. <laughs> I think that's wrong. <laughs> okay, so uh, any other participants? Who... Okay, Pak, silakan, Pak. Dibantu ininya, mic-nya. So, until... Okay, this is the last... Uh... Uh, thank you, moderator. Okay. And our best colleagues, Dr. Iwanto. Uh -huh. <laughs> I hear. Okay. Uh, this Please is very, very. Yourself. My name is Herman Hidayat. I am researcher also here in this center. This is very interesting a topic about the challenge of the difference and groupings. <clears throat> I would like to have the real reality today that it has happened at all good. It is being a good war, for example, between Russia and Ukraine. It highlights that the external factor perceived by the uh, Russia that Ukraine would like to lies to the West and to enter to the NATO. It is seriously a challenge for the politic uh, perceived by the Russia a very, very potential in the future. And for another internal factor, minority of the uh, Russian people who live in uh, two province or three provinces in the eastern of Ukraine meet discrimination by the high politic auto by the system of Ukraine. It is make Putin very, very angry because this report Putin it is a very strong defense of the Russian rights, people, uh, but people rights of the Russia. Yeah. These two factors eventually affect to the uh, Russia launch blitz war, I think, blitz war to, to make lesson for Ukraine. But yeah, it is really straightened for the world in terms of the food security in terms of the world's global yeah, uh, yeah, challenge, especially in terms of the uh, gandum, what we say gandum? Green. Green, yeah, at the weight, yeah. Weight, yes, that sort of the weight in many minority of the uh, Africa people or also Eastern, uh, Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia or other and other, yeah, it is really, really read for the win. I would like to have a political, uh, no, the analysis. If I put the, what we say, the problem of the challenge, out of the challenge yeah, of difference, sub in theoretical framework, to analysis how this conflict occurred, how the, micro, uh, the resolution, I mean, how the result of the conflict resolution based on your opinion. Thank you. I think a uh, question, can your, uh, how, uh, how if your perspective on uh, dealing with difference uh, be implemented uh, in the case of uh, conflict, uh, Russian and Ukraine, conflict and how to deal with uh, the conflict too. It can. It can. <laughs> That's what. <laughs> there is one answer for everything. I'm sorry. Okay. It it's not relevant. Mm -hmm. It's not relevant at all. First, the war has to come to an end. Mm -hmm. You can't have all of this and people are killing you. 
Sorry, it, it's, it's not relevant. Okay. So what I'm saying is not relevant to that to that conflict. So a live armed conflict is going on 24 hours a day since February 2020. Mm -hmm. It's not. And I think that part of what you said in your analysis is correct, but I think there are other aspects to it as well. Basically, the Russians, basically Putin and the Russian uh, leadership denies the autonomy and independence of Ukraine. They de deny the legitimacy of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. And that should give you an indication that this is much about much more than NATO. Um, they refuse to accept the existence, the independent existence of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Um, yes, there are absolutely fascist aspects to the Ukrainian population, no doubt about it. Um, there was, yes, discrimination against Russian speakers, but it depends where and how. Uh, Odessa, I mean, I was in Odessa three months before the war. Um, equally Ukrainian Russian was spoken, equally Ukrainian and Russian um, street signs. Um, it, it, it's much more complicated than any, I think any of us understand. And I also think that the issue of NATO, I think this is just clear, the issue of NATO became more and more pressing as the war went on and on. So that now, now you have Finland and then and, and Swedish, you know, as, as Sweden up to thought as part of NATO. And so Russia's border with NATO has now expanded by 835 kilometers when, when Finland joined NATO. So all, all this is the result of the Russian aggression. But in terms of the, the real point, I don't think what I'm saying has anything at all to do and can offer any solution at all to the war. I do think that afterwards, something like this has to happen. And, you know, after World War II, after World War II, the German and French and English industrialists came together for weeks in Switzerland and cooked for one another and washed dishes for one another and began to build what became the European community. But it, it began as a committee for moral disarmament. And it was by the industrial leaders of the belligerent countries. And that is again experience, an experience of um, right after the conflict. And I'll tell you that in Africa, I'll tell you that in Africa today, um, when they, um, Anybody, nobody has a ball, right? Hold this. So in Africa today, when tribes, when clans are in conflict, and social workers organize meetings afterwards to try to stop the, the killing. So um, a colleague of mine, a social worker, a person who deals with conflict resolution in East, in East Africa. So he gets people together in a circle. And let's pretend this is a ball. Mm -hmm. The ball, uh, ball, and we get people together. Ball like this. <laughs> and your cheat. <laughs> I, I won't worry. I won't actually. <laughs> you can't because you're a Yeah. But then you have to. Take you have to transfer to the ball team. to your team. People who are killing one another. Okay. And I have to do that. You have to put it, and then you go to the next person and so on. So. Mm -hmm. Have to make some rules. Yeah, so so this, but this, you cannot do when, when, when people are being killed. You cannot do when children are being killed. I'm sorry. But professor, this is this is exactly what I um, uh, said at the beginning of our our lectures that this is a social initiative, right? You try to raise awareness of people about uh, category, about the prejudice, about how to uh, you know. To suspend it, your judgment, yeah. but some in 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 some cases, government interest, government, uh, the politics, you know, uh, determine the way that you interact with okay. with with the difference in this. In this case, actually, uh, Russian and uh, Ukraine can can we make as an example? Perhaps you try to wear uh, to raise awareness among. Uh, the the two nations 
people of these two nations, but the governments has their own interests yeah, that not automatically in line with our say a greater good of uh, knowing the difference and how to uh, deal or, or live with it. How can how can you expect that? I mean, is this uh, useful? <laughs> Sorry. <about Okay>. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I just uh, I, I, okay. No, no, not not uh, not to solve the problem, but we have the real uh, reality uh, that, that many uh, parties do not, you know, do not have an easy way to to deal with difference Nobody. with yeah with their uh, given uh, vested interests and 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 so oh. other so how can we you know uh, promote this uh what you struggle for <laughs> to make a peace so i think so i really think that it's not just some governments it's all governments yeah. it's all governments but people have agency people can organize you can organize on the grassroots. You can do things at a lower level. You can slowly do things. This is how anything gets done. This is how any change happens. So you don't say, because the government is working against me, I'm going to go to sleep or just try to make money. Uh, no, I'm, I'm serious. My book was the only book which argued against civil society, so I don't know. So everybody used it to mean whatever they wanted. So I said it was a useless, uh, a useless concept. The right used it, the left used it. In 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 Asia, the government used it. Uh, um, but no, I think that you're. I think you're absolutely right that that government forces are strong. But here, there's we've been in existence for more than twenty years. And we've done programs, and people are adapting our pedagogy, and people come to participate in the programs. This is all I know how to do. I don't know how to solve the conflict in Ukraine and Russia. I don't know how to solve the conflict between the United States and China. Sorry, I don't. <laughs> Maybe you do. I don't. My, my knowledge and my strength is very limited and very circumscribed and very narrow. This is what I know how to do, and I know that it works in the realm where it happens. And I think that we can reproduce it. And that's it. I don't think that, um, I, I, I just I just don't think that, that um, there, like I said, there's not one, in, one answer, there's difference. There's difference and different problems have to be dealt with differently. Why was I in Odessa, in Odessa three months before the war? Because people wanted to arrange a program in Ukraine, precisely. And we had built, that's why I was in Ukraine. I mean, this was the project. We had, done a pro, we had done a project in China and I think 2017 or 2018, I don't remember. And there was a young man who had then just finished his doctorate who was part of the program. The Chinese program, I think was the least successful program we ever had because we had government surveillance and I had no idea what was going on. I was really like out. I didn't understand how closely we were surveilled by the government. But even though it was the worst program, this young man, who then became the director of an institute a few years later, contacted me and said, we want to do this in Ukraine. We need to do this in Ukraine precisely because of these issues that you're talking about. And so I went to Ukraine and I met and we started planning. And three months later, the Russians invaded. So that's what I'm saying, you can't do anything. You can't do anything when people are shooting. You, you, well, <laughs> Not serious. When people are shooting, the only thing you can do is shoot back. I mean, <laughs> what can you do? So is this the real uh, living with difference? Is this the, is the real uh, the government can do? Uh, what? No, no, no. Okay. okay. Uh, no, no, no. There is another uh, you you will add. No. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. For this uh, lecture, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> you ready? You have already. Uh, I think you already present uh, what you think. Okay, okay. So, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think we have already almost two hours, right?
free <laughs> to have conversation with uh, Professor Serikman. Uh, I'm sorry if uh, there is uh, sometimes hot, uh, <laughs> hot conversation uh, among us. <laughs> okay. Challenge. Okay. okay. They're, they're all for me to learn from. It was, it was, okay. For me, it was great. It was great. I hope it was interesting for you. For me, for me, it was very interesting. Okay. I think uh, we thank uh, again uh, Professor Seligman for his uh, readiness to share with us his extensive uh, knowledge and experience, uh, not only as uh, academics, but also as an activist, right, Professor, in promoting uh, tolerance and peace uh, among uh, countries, including, I hope, in Indonesia also. So uh, thank you again. Uh, I like to extend to our participants, both online as well as offline. 43 uh, online participants, and thank you all of them. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not uh, quite good in uh, moderating the, uh, the, uh, the professor. Thank you again. So actually, uh, eventually you want to make a closing <laughs> remark. <laughs> No, no, not closing. No, not closing. The people, whether online or here, should feel free to write to me if you're interested. Should go online, could see about the program. Could, if you're interested, write to me. Yeah. See the yeah. Go to the see the website. Just see Google communities engaging with difference in religion. There's a website with a lot of information. My email. Write to me if you're interested. What did you say about Chinese business? Make a move, make a little step, make a little step and we see what could happen. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you, you uh, ladies and gentlemen. And I hope we can meet again in sometime in another event. Thank you. Terima kasih, Pak Rudy. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this event today and I hope you all have enjoyed and benefited from our Honorable Professor Adam Salidman and also to Pak Rudy Harissa Alam from uh, the Center of Religion and Belief as a moderator today and I would like to thank them once again for their valuable contribution in this event and of course to all active participants in this room all or in uh, online. And then um, also to Bu Lilis Suryani as a head of Research Center for Society and Culture for international lecture today. And before we end this uh, event, uh, please to Professor Adam, Bu Lilis will give uh, some souvenir from the brain. Uh, kan fotonya ada bisa ayo. Uh, pada para hadirin kami bersama untuk berfoto bersama dengan Bu Kapus dan uh, Profesor Adam Salidman. Silakan Bapak Ibu berfoto bersama. Mungkin Bu Kapus berada di depan meja Bu di sebelah sini di depan. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>
silakan. Kalau bisa satu baris bagus, kalau tidak ya terpaksa harus dua baris. <laughs> Cukup ya, tapi ya. nanti kecil-kecil bu mukanya nggak apa-apa ya bu. Silakan rapat-rapat. Ya mungkin yang di belakang juga di antara dua kepala yang di depan bisa terlihat tetap ya gitu ya. Kalau yang di belakang. Di antara dua, nah di tengah-tengah jadi kan, nah kayak di kondangan lah, kayak di kondangan. Oke, siap. Di sini-sini boleh masalah.